Uh, and at this point, we're recording two seconds in. I'm going to pass it to Michelle and, yeah, begin. Hello, my name is Michelle Perez. As always, I'm joined by my buddy Jake, my buddy Ruben, and after some extended discussion uh, recently, because we had to talk about the uniting of one another through posts and et cetera, I've come back around to this, and uh, Eliza Gager, now also a buddy, part of Buddy Squad, uh, anointed <laughs> in the hellfires of buddydom. Uh, this is working on it. Uh, today, we're uh, kind of in a strange moment. And as always, you're going to be hearing this late as we're unstuck in time. Uh, in terms of legislative efforts, I don't know if you've heard my deep ass baritone grandpa voice, but I'm a woman named Michelle Perez that sounds like a grandma. I am trans. Uh, there's a really unprecedented legislative effort across the board against any and all trans rights as it revolves around, uh, you know, control of your own body. It reflects what has been done against women and their bodily autonomy as it relates to abortion rights, uh, rights to certain sort of contraceptive care. And it's very disgusting to me. I think it's terrible. I hate the on swelling of culture war that informs this and a great deal of it is done solely in terms of hate bad faith and not wanting better medical outcomes for individual people uh i think people are sort of doomsaying a lot as of this unstuck in time moment uh but we have elders and People persist on beyond the pain of the moment. And while we are a group of people that manifestly can be wiped off the map because there are so few of us, we haven't been. And we won't be uh, because we have one another. I'm tired of doomsaying. I'm tired of people going on about this as if this is all there can be. When we have elders that exist today, that have told us that we will be outside the law. And we are right now. Uh, Miss Major went from being in New York to now being in Arkansas and is one of uh, many people that will be at the mercy of the laws in Arkansas. Uh, and she is still alive. And we're all still alive. And we will continue to be as best we can. And uh, that's all I have to say about that. Fuck them. Fuck them all. They're not getting us. Who is Miss... Who? Mi Who's Miss Major? Miss Major is a very famous trans elder that was uh, part of the Stonewall riots alongside Sylvia Rivera, uh, Marsha P. Johnson, and uh, several others. Like, this is one of the people that have sort of been a, a guidepost to a lot of us uh, in terms of trans women and giving us sort of a point of reference for uh, sort of living, being authentic, and, uh, you know, making yourself heard in, in both activism and actual mutual aid and helping one another. This goes... Oh, Miss Major Griffin, get Gracie. Okay, yes. sorry. Yes, she, she's, uh, she's been a part of the Okra Project. I don't know if she is now. Uh, but basically, she's she's one of uh, several from back then that still around today, and it's sort of a, a testament to you know, in enduring, and we can endure and we should endure. Uh, now to kind of take it away from the hyper seriousness of that shit. Uh, I wanted to ask y'all how y'all are doing today. Uh, I'm doing personally pretty well. Um, glad that we're recording again and uh, excited to get to our 
lighthearted subject today, um, especially having our first guest who none of us uh, know outside of outside of you know the realm of recording for our podcast and, and independent work. Um, to that end, let's kick it to Eliza. Uh, yeah, I became familiar with Marissa's work um, on uh, Instagram, I think, which is where most of us have to do our business these days. And um, after being definitely taken in by the, I think, artistic and thoughtful basis of the perfumes that Marissa makes um, with her imprint, uh, Redomance, Redomance? I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, you can pronounce it however you want. I always tell people that, but I just pronounce it Redomance. Okay. Um, Nice. Yeah. yeah, welcome, uh, Marissa Zappas. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I ordered uh, the winter sample pack from Rediments and really, really, really loved all four scents that I got. Uh, they, I, I've had some experience with independent perfume and have been mostly disappointed, I gotta say. I'm not going to name names, but the majority of independent perfume smells like a shop that sells crystal wizards so um it was nice to uh and and actually surprising to receive perfumes that were professional and smelled incredible and were also very very original um and i've really been enjoying them since then so uh after looking at your bio on your website and learning that you have a Degree in um, anthropology? Yeah. Is that correct? And you yeah. studied in France, right? Um, yeah, I studied um, for a semester. Actually, in my undergrad, I just studied abroad. But I went back um, a lot for my ethnographic research. So what um, were you studying? What was the topic of your MA? Yeah, so... Um, my master's was actually on the, <laughs> it wound up being pretty focused on perfume and the history of um, olfaction, but originally I was determined to write about the history of cemetery construction um, just because, nice. yeah, I was, um, when I went as an undergrad to study abroad, um, and I guess kind of a cliche, like kind of go to Paris kind of way. Um, I just spent all of my time um, at Père Lachaise, um, which if anyone doesn't know, it's a huge cemetery sort of on the periphery of Paris. Um, it's where um, Jim Morrison's buried and I think Chopin, like a bunch of people are buried there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful. And I would just go every day and I wound up writing a short, um, sort of a mini ethnography on the history of Père Lachaise, like when I was in my undergrad. So um, what I learned was just that um, Père Lachaise was pretty much the first cemetery to be built on the periphery of a major city prior to prior to the construction of Père Lachaise. Um, people were just buried in backyards or in church, um, you know, the backyards of churches. And also, if you are, if you you know know about the catacombs in Paris, like you know, bodies had just been sort of haphazardly thrown into the ground for for centuries and centuries and centuries and then they were all exhumed um and you know put in the catacombs and then it was like at that moment that Père Lachaise was constructed on the periphery um and death was sort of removed from the centers of cities so um and Paris was really the first city to do this and then it you know all around Europe they they started um they started doing that and um, so as I, anyway, as I was doing all this, um, really like, uh, um, goth, like research, um, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I was reading about, um, there was this one, I think he was, uh, I think he's a sensory anthropologist. Anyway, he said something about the project. It was all part of the project of deodorization. There was this huge, um, movement to clean up Paris, to clean up the dead, but also to, to just clean it because, um, so, I mean, Paris just was completely neglected, you know, by the, um, you know, 
Marie Antoinette or whatever. Um, and uh, it was just dirty and there was disease. And um, so anyway, he called it this project of deodorization. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, and it was also this moment um, where basically perfume as we know it today came into existence. So um, obviously, you know, people have been using oils and incenses since the beginning of time. Um, but it was really this idea of, of essential oils in a blend um, mixed with alcohol in a spray bottle um, that so I mean, this was their point of, this was the point of origin for perfume. Also like Eau de Toilette, um, you know, Eau de Toilette is just sort of a more water, watered down version of perfume. It has a lower concentration of oils to alcohol ratio. And, um, you know, they would scent toilet water because the sewer system was just completely exploded. So it was part of the reason why Paris smelled so bad. So Eau de Toilette was, um, that's the origin of Eau de Toilette. Um, and I just thought wow. that was so interesting. And I was like, you know, I was just thinking about, um, and I, I had always been like so obsessed with perfume since I was young, I would spend hours just reading perfume reviews online and, um, could never really afford the collection that I wanted, but, um, mm -hmm. just really enjoyed it. And, um, so I don't know. I just started thinking more seriously about perfume after um, sort of reading about the history of it and also just thinking about how there's always this sort of inherent connection between death and and perfume. I mean, perfume in a way is um, I always say this, but um, all smells are decay. Mm -hmm. And if something is not in a state of decay, then it's not going to smell and mm -hmm. perfume. I wouldn't necessarily say perfume is decay, but it is in the state of um, like disillusion. Like it is literally, it is evaporating off of your skin. Um, and yeah, so I, I think, um, I also think perfume can be necromancy. I think there are just so many connections between um, smell and specifically perfume and um, attitudes towards death and death itself. So that was how I began thinking seriously about perfume how I became a perfumer is like a whole other story um which I can talk about later or now or whatever that's it's cool to hear uh your entryway into it I think um specifically because it is tied to that that history I I'm I, like as you were describing all of that stuff I was just thinking about wow like it must have been it must have sucked to live in Paris and just walk outside and be like, smells like dead people. Yeah. Uh, I think that was true of a lot yeah. of major cities. The, the Absolutely. The Thames was also just an open sewer for a long time until they made an effort to clean it up. So that's, yeah, it was nasty. Um, there was also yeah. an effort during that period to move cooking away from living spaces. And so we got the, th that turned into sort of the Victorian separation of the servant quarters because it stunk like cooking and they hated that. So mm -hmm. in, in a lot of those older houses, there will be, you know, the kitchen is like a mile away from, from the serving room. So you would have to like, you'd have to fucking run to get stuff there still warm. Um, yeah. But yeah. Th there was a whole thing about smells in, in that, that period of, of, of Western history for sure. I think the thing that you said about perfume being in a state of decay is incredibly insightful because mm -hmm. it is. I mean, it's just, it's it decay is the process of sort of your molecules dissolving into the material around you and kind of, you know, returning to the, to the earth or the air. So mm -hmm. um, I love that. I love how you, I love how you put that. So um, tell me about your business and how it's set up and what you do. Yeah. Um, hmm. um, so I, um, I think it would make a little more sense if I just talked, um, briefly about like my, my background, um, yeah. in perfumery. Yeah. So, um, I w was tempted to do a PhD, but ultimately decided not to. I was, um, while I was in grad school, I wound up getting a temp job at Gibidon, which is a major commercial fragrance house. It's where sort of um, the majority of perfumers in the world work. And there really aren't that many perfumers or they say there are more astronauts than perfumers. 
Um, but a lot of perfumers work at Jivadon. There are a couple other houses. And so basically, like, if you are a client like Estee Lauder or whatever, and you want to launch a new perfume, you'll go to Jivadon and sort of hire one of the perfumers there to create something for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, so I got a job working. These houses are very, um, difficult to get a position in unless you know someone they're generally um I worked for a Swiss company but they're sort of old school they've been around for a long time and very protected um but I was super lucky I took this receptionist job and I worked there for about six months and then right as I graduated um and meanwhile while I was there I was kind of using it as like uh an opportunity to try and figure out how to get training, um, Mm -hmm. through the company to be a perfumer. And, um, so right as I graduated, there was an opening in the lab to be an apprentice to a master perfumer. Every perfumer has their own, um, technician or apprentice. It depends on the position and the perfumer. And, um, I was really lucky and, um, got this amazing sort of old retired perfumer who semi-retired, who didn't send me too much work and was willing to like take time to train me. And, um, I worked there for two years and he, um, helped me memorize, you know, hundreds of smells and um, that was pretty insane. Um, and then I left after a couple of years just because it was a super corporate environment that I just long term wasn't sure. Like I was really uncomfortable, basically. <laughs> like I didn't want to keep working there. And um, but I loved what I did, so it was hard. And um, but I wound up leaving. I saved up money and I quit. And um, I started Rediments. Um, and when I first left Jivadon, I really like did not think that I would be um, working out of a home lab ever. Like I really thought that I was giving up perfumery and was just going to, um, because basically um, the, the first formula is complicated, but the first formula I launched with Rediments, um, the oil came from Jivadon. So mm-hmm. it's really... Um, I didn't feel like I needed it. And also I, I just wasn't imagining that I would be working as a perfumer. I kind of imagined that I would be working, I don't know, as like a business owner or something. Um, which is so strange for me to think back. I just thought that it would be impossible for me to set up a lab that would work. Um, Mm -hmm. and uh, but eventually I did, and I have a lab in my home now, but it's taken me, you know, four years to build, I was slowly, slowly building it. Um, the oil for Queen Nzinga, which was the first perfume I launched with, um, for Rediments came from Jivadon. So that oil, I do not produce in my home, like most everything else. Um, so I left Jivadon. I started Rediments. Um, I launched one perfume, then I launched another, and I have two right now available. Um, and, you know, it's been a few years since it's been like four years since I left. Um, and just during that time, I've tried to um, collaborate with as many people as I possibly can, I think, who are interesting to me. I think one of the limitations of being a commercial perfumer today is that you don't um, – you really don't have freedom of choice in terms of what you work on. Like you basically have to do 75% bath and body works. And um, then, you know, if you're lucky, you get like, I don't know, a Ralph Lauren perfume or something where there's like a little more creative. um, Yeah. So it's really rare, I think for um, independent perfumers to have this sort of background in, um, in classical perfumery, which is why, as you, you know, noticed, um, my perfumes don't really smell like just essential oil blends. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but oh. the industry well, is kind yeah, of here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's that's perfect. Um, it's it's all very interesting stuff. Rest assured. Okay. Like I've been I've been think, I've been engaged. <laughs> okay. Yeah, most independent perfumes they show up and they smell like patchouli. 
<laughs> and then some other stuff, but it's mostly usually patchouli. Um, and I think there's just, I mean, I know nothing about perfume, so I, I can't say what goes wrong exactly, but yeah, there's, there's just always a difference between, you know, Tom Ford and something that you get from Etsy. Um, so it was the first time that I had ordered an independent perfume from uh, somebody that wasn't associated with, you know, a big retailer that I got something that wasn't, didn't smell like something I had gotten from Etsy. You know, it was yeah really, really something special. Um, so that's why I wanted to have you on. So uh, Jevoudan, is that, does it have any relationship to the Jevoudan where the werewolf went ran amok? I have to know. Oh my god! Um, I don't think so, but maybe they're, they are. They're spelled differently. <laughs> differently, it's a it's a G E instead of a G I, but uh, oh, the okay. rest of the spelling is is the same. So no. I didn't know if it was regional or what. Wow, um, I've never heard of this. Um, I do feel yeah. like Vinny is. And- <laughs> never mind. He was called the the Beast of Givaudan and it's kind of a it's kind of a monster mystery, a historical monster mystery. It killed a lot of people. Uh, and nobody's really oh, sure cool. if it was like just a real wolf or if there was a serial killer or what was going on, but you know, at the time there was a werewolf panic. But yeah, no, I just wanted to ask cuz I, I I sort of recognize the similarity in the as, name. As an aside, do yeah. do the French like believe in in werewolves? Werewolves? All Western Europeans believe in werewolves. Most Eastern Europeans, but I don't think there's a human culture that doesn't have a werewolf myth. But if it, if they don't have wolves, then it'll be whatever the local animal is. But yeah, shape shifting myths are universal in human culture. So funny. It reminds me of this time um, when someone who I was working with at Jivron, um asked me, basically, like, explained to me that um, when I'm you know, how when I'm ovulating, I smell, I will smell more intensely and suggested that I schedule all my smell tests, like based on my menstrual cycle. Hmm. And (laughs) I was like, this is so weird. (laughs) Yeah, that's very esoteric. I cannot believe Hmm. that like one of my bosses is asking me when I get my period, but um, okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, was this, was this France the time? And, yeah, that's yeah. a pu- that's a puzzler for human resources. Like, is that sexual <laughs> harassment or is that just good work, job well, advice? Just, that sounds extremely <laughs> French. Yeah, I was about to say, uh, well, yeah, like, it was in France. I mean, it's true. It is. It is yeah. true. Uh, but it is also very inappropriate. So, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely wow. felt like it was um, inappropriate, but it made me laugh so hard. Like, I don't know. Just right. It's so, <laughs> it's like almost clinical. <laughs> like what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the perfume industry is honestly so weird because it's part of, it's part of beauty. It's also part of fashion, but they really think that they're more intellectual. Um, sure. In this I way, could, that's that like sense. so yeah and but it's just in this way that's like so gross to me like um (laughs) I don't know like I just it's it's complicated because I feel like a lot of their research like especially even within marketing and their smell research like is fascinating I mean the company is huge like they say on average you come into contact with um eight of their products a day without even realizing it because they make everything from perfume to cleaning products to food flavorings and, oh, wow. um, yeah, so it's super interesting, but I just feel like the language itself that they use is often like, so, um, it's just really snobby and mm. kind of, uh, I don't know. It's, it's sort of meant to keep people out of the industry. Like I always say that if there's anyone who kind of wants to get their foot in the door, who's interested in being a perfumer or an evaluator, a scent evaluator, or, you know, even just like a, a writer, you know, copyright, like um, to let me know and I'll like use all my contacts to help them get in just because it is really hard to get into one of these companies, but they pay really well. And um, yeah, if you're someone who likes, who doesn't mind working in a corporate environment, um, right? great job. <laughs> is that kind of what, um, 
you know, like that, it, it makes sense that if, if, if that's kind of what you encountered when you were working in that environment, you, you wanted to stay with the scent part of it, but stake out away from the kind of faux intellectualism yeah. and such. Yeah, totally. I mean, it wasn't even the faux intellectualism. It was a lot of things, but, um, I feel like faux intellectualism, like it can kind of handle. <laughs> sure, but sure. It, it was, yeah, it was, it was other things too. I think I was very concerned about how I was going to build a lab that worked. Um, the lab that I worked out of at Jibidon was, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. I mean, there were thousands of different raw materials, natural, synthetic, like top quality. I mean, it was completely unreal and um also you know we every single bottle of oil um in the lab had an expiration um mm. they were constantly swapped out so just the money that was going into sustaining the quality of the lab was so insane um you know my lab here is i mean i honestly like i always say i actually don't know how much it costs um total mm. <laughs> it was just something i built slowly over time um, but I don't have the, you know, I don't have the luxury of like swapping out raw materials um, due to expiration or anything like that. But I find a way to make it work. And I feel like if I'm smelling something and it's not smelling right, then um, I'll just toss it in order a new one. Um, I was going to ask. So gonna it's ask. been. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to ask it with regard to working in a lab. Uh I previously done chemical work at some point in my life where it would be commercial chemicals as well as uh, basically cleaning agents, which is a whole other ball of wax. But a lot of them would have scents involved and the like. I, I wondered uh, when you go through the process within the lab, working with the bases and the raws and what have you, is there like anyone you sort of like run through this stuff with like after the fact? in terms of quality yeah, control? Yeah, you mean like when I'm working? Yeah, you mean like when I'm working from home now? Well, I mean, yeah, it could be uh, working from home or yeah, just as easy to like, let's say a process like that, yes. Yeah, so, um, well, when I was working at Jividon, there there was a whole quality control team. There were perfumers, like I wasn't evaluating the scents themselves so much. I was just making making them in the lab. Um, when I'm, so that was a whole other thing. Um, but now when I'm home, it's hard because like, especially during COVID, I feel like even if I make something I like, I can't quite like trust my nose and like, I'm just working by myself all, all day. Um, and, um, I do have a friend though, who will come over and kind of evaluate, um, the smells with me and she'll tell me like what she thinks. And I totally trust her her sense of smell. Um, so that's been really nice. And that is actually the role of an evaluator. So there are perfumers and evaluators and, um, at these type of companies and evaluators, um, it's super interesting. Like they will often just sit down with the perfumer and smell what the perfumer has done and just sort of say like too much cherry or like too much, um, too much, um, you know, vetiver or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and evaluators also have direct contact with sales and marketing. So they get the brief from the client and then have to make sure that that brief is translated olfactively. So they're in between the perfumer and marketing. And I think it's actually a really interesting position. It's really creative. They're the ones who kind of bring the formula to life. Um, so working alone, I'm definitely my own perfumer and evaluator in one um yeah if that makes does that make sense absolutely that's wild yeah, yeah. no yeah that's cool. that's a cool like i never thought about that it obviously once you explain it it makes sense like if you if you're a company set up to make perfumes you want that kind that, of thing. that's the, that's but, the thing um, what a job that must be to be the go-between like yeah. did you did you work with many of those when you were at the company Definitely. Um, I was actually really interested in becoming an evaluator. And I, if, if I were to ever go back to work at one of these companies, it would be to be an evaluator. Evaluators have more fun. They aren't kind of like trapped behind computers like perfumers are all day. Um, so, yeah. That, 
could you could you talk a little bit about how a, a perfumer is trapped behind a computer? That's actually quite interesting to me. Um, <laughs> what what kind of software and stuff are you guys using? Well, so I don't actually work behind a computer. Um, I mm. use a note. I use a notebook. Um, but I nice. just mean Classic. I. <laughs> yeah, um, I just mean in the like commercial fragrance houses, um, they they type their formulas into the computer and then they send them through a program to the lab. So Olivier, who was my mentor, would just we were in a huge office on um, 57th Street and he would like sit in his office and the lab, like the experimental lab where I worked in took up half the floor and I would just be in there and he would like send me his formula would show up on my computer. And then my computer was like connected to a scale, which was in the lab. And I would just sort of run around and grab all the ingredients and compound his formulas. Um, and, but he really wouldn't leave his office. And then I would bring him samples throughout the day of what I create, of what I had made for him, what he had sent me. And um, he would just smell them and then like, you know, maybe send me another one that was the same thing I just made, but like less Jasmine, you know, or whatever. So um, that's how we worked. That's, that's just really cool. I, I, it just is like having no conception of how, how it would actually look. <laughs> it's, it's funny to think about a guy kind of taking some smells and then tapping away at a computer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can send you some pictures of the office if you're interested at some point, Um, because I feel like you kind of need to see the way it looks and like how a perfumer's desk looks like their desks are crazy. They just have little bottles everywhere with like blotters and then like a computer kind of in the middle of everything. Yeah, my, absolutely. We I would, would uh, love to my, see that. My, yeah. yeah, it would be good supplemental material. For my the my classic too. conception of that is just, you know, sort of imagining those stock photos with someone with big goggles over their eyes and the lab coat and big, big, big blue gloves. But it, it must obviously be different in reality. Well, to be honest, when I worked in the lab, I wore goggles and gloves and a lab coat. Um, Dear God, it's mandatory. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> never mind. Yeah. There's the t- there's yeah. There's the two halves. <laughs> yeah, I don't really in my apartment, but I should. I have an air purifier <laughs> though, which I hope helps. So it's got to be difficult in the lab environment, both at home and in the Givadon environment, to like get back to a baseline, like a neutral smell zone so that you can tell what something smells like. I don't know. It's, are there a lot of smells floating around at different times that you have to account for when you're testing a, 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 a formula? Um, yes and no. Um, I feel, I always say that I feel like um, creating perfume is kind of like writing in the sense that um it's more about your brain as opposed to your actual sense of smell. Like, you know how, if you're writing something, um, you're just, and you're staring at, you're staring at it for too long. You really just need to step away from it for a bit, Mm -hmm. um, and come back to it. And, um, I feel like it's the same thing with creating perfume. It's less about like my nose, not being able to process any more smells. And it's more about like my mental state. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it is interesting, um, you know, most perfumers are French and, um, you know, I think up until recently, most French people smoked. Um, mm-hmm. and so <laughs> there are all these like pictures of perfumers, like from back in the day with like a blotter in one hand and a cigarette in the other, they would be like smoking <laughs> and working on their perfumes. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So people who Just- say that that smoking, you know, inhibits your sense of smell. Like I do think that's true to a certain degree, just because it affects the mucus level in in your nose, but um, smells are mostly ideas. Um, And a good perfumer, like um, it's funny. I'm okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to use this example for my mentor, but a lot of perfumers, when they get really old, they're still working, but they can't actually smell. Mm. And so dang that's that's kind of cool that's really cool yeah it's really 
it's yeah like I think they just know in their head what the smell is going to turn out like um and I feel like to a certain extent I can do that at this point like I I know something's going to smell a certain way if I combine it in this you know um I'm definitely not at that level but I I I get it um so I just yeah I guess to answer your question I don't really feel like um smelling and perfumers have such a high tolerance for for scent like we don't really need to I can smell all day um I don't need to like smell coffee or something and if I do need to step away for a minute I'll just smell in my sleeve or something um but um yeah smells are I mean I don't know as you probably know like it's the same part of your brain that processes memory so smells are memories and um and I just think that your physical capacity or like your biological capacity to smell uh, doesn't necessarily impact your sort of more grand sense of how you experience smell like psychologically. Does that make sense? Yeah. You don't have to be sitting at the piano to compose music. Once you know, you know. For that sure. makes sense. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to ask, uh, you, as you were talking about uh, scent, scent as it relates to memory, um, as I've come to understanding or understand it, uh, listening to you and Eliza speak about this, as it relates to aesthetic, in terms of scent and aesthetic tying to memory, uh, do 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 these do these sort of be do these sort of relate to maybe specific historical events? or maybe like more deeply held personal events. Like how, I, I wonder about that sometimes uh, because w when you mentioned writing earlier, I thought it was very interesting that you tied, you tied that to, to the idea of writing and articulating an idea. I think it's very interesting, the idea of articulating a feeling uh, of memory through smell, but in terms of aesthetic as it relates to history and that, uh, is it just uh, things that have happened to people or their way of articulating an experience? Uh, is that something that sort of gets asked of you when you're creating something? Um, sorry. So your, your question um, is just about, is about political. No, 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 not, not um, politics, like or, but I, I mean, aesthetics. Uh, and and scent mm -hmm. as it relates to memory is it is it a, a events uh be it they historical or personal i i guess i i think she's she's asking i think what michelle's asking is when people ask you to yeah, make a yeah. scent i don't know what else you're referring oh, to oh i see yeah, I, okay. I apologize i'm sorry no 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 worries i totally understand the question now um you know what? Sometimes it's, it's, um, it's both. I do personal perfumes also, um, personalized bespoke fragrances and, um, I've had everything. I mean, there was one, I had one client who just really loved horseback riding when she was young and she wanted a perfume that reminded her of like the stables and, um, mm. and then, you know, I had one, another client who, this is more like futuristic, but she wanted to, she wanted to meet someone, um, in the future and she wanted to love perfume. <laughs> and then I had another client who they were doing like a couple's perfume. And so, I don't know, it was just a whole, they had certain ways, they had certain smells that they associated with each other prior to making this perfume with me. And so they told me all of their smells and they were in them. So, um, but I don't know, I guess I think, um, this might not be your question, but I, I do think that like collectively people have, um, sent memories like based on historical events and, um, which is something that's totally like always fascinated me, but there's just really not a lot of information on, but, um, I think that analyzing perfume trends can tell us a lot about, um, sort of the state of mind, um, of people and also like what was going on. I mean, if you look at the perfume trends around world war two, they were, um, they were really like smoky and kind of disturbing. Um, 
if we look at the perfume trends, like, um, I don't know, even the eighties, eighties is like my favorite perfume decade. Just the, you know, the perfumes that came out in the eighties for, for men and women, like were so crazy and loud and like just the aesthetics. I mean, talk about like, um, I think also feminism during that time was, was very different. It was, um, you know, it was like shoulder pads. It was like, um, not, I mean, not feminism, but I guess, um, femininity. Um, but also feminism was starting to become more loud. Just everything was loud and, um, perfumes yeah, were really neon, neon masculinity colors. excess. Or when you say excess, I immediately think of yeah. Drake hard and war, just this obnoxious smelling. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's I like one of the only perfume. perfumes I know. Yeah. Yeah. Also, was like that... Opium by YSL, Poison. Oh, that's an '80s perfume too. Those were all '80s perfumes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I I've so... had a direct experience with Scent Memory actually, because um, when I was about twelve, my house burnt down, and we spent you know weeks in the the rubble, documenting stuff for insurance. Mm -hmm. And for years afterwards, if I smelled anything burning, I had a panic attack. And that went away over time. Um, PTSD does, as long as you're safe, PTSD will fade over time. But yeah, nothing else triggered it was only the smell. And that's very common with, um, with PTSD patients is they will be triggered by smells, sometimes to the extent that they don't even know they're not aware of what's triggering them because they have forgotten what's happened to them. They just have a, a hard coded memory of the smell and it can cause, it can cause serious problems um, just out of nowhere. Cause they don't, they don't know what's going on, but yeah, it's the definitely smell is, is related to the, the deepest recesses of memory. Yeah. Like borderline unconscious, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was going to ask uh, to sort of follow up briefly uh, when you had spoken about a sort of collective sense memory. Do you do you sort of mean because I've heard some things about this and I don't know the science and all, all credit to you, given you have knowledge of anthropology and that's been a focus of study. Are you talking about something akin to like genetic memory? Uh, no. Oh, okay. All yeah. Right. I, I think it's more like, you know, like just when you catch a smell of something and your brain mm. immediately remembers yeah, you, the, okay. the last time you, so, so to me, like for my example, cause I'm not, I don't have a relationship with perfume or anything like that, um, as such, but I've been, I, I, I definitely, um, have, you know, whatever, a, a, a sense of smell that I've been using my whole life. And my biggest sense memory is, is sort of being surrounded by, um, like if I'm ever in a place where there's a lot of books, like a, like an old bookstore or something mm. like that, just surrounded by paper or leather and plastic, even, um, I will I will flash back to the the comic book shop I grew up, mm. and just like the the uh, the hours and hours I spent there between shelves of just like reams of toys and paper, um, and ink, uh, dried ink and all that stuff, um, and that is an immediately comforting smell to me. Like if I just walk into a bookstore, my brain will be put more five percent more at ease than it was, like you know, before I entered the bookstore. And yeah. that is that is definitely because of the smells going on. Absolutely, that's. I mean, Marissa can tell me I'm wrong or back me up either way, but I think that the wood pulp decomposition produces a chemical called vanillin, which is where we get that the old book smell. Um, so. Old, old books have that sort of vanilla smell. Is that correct? Or have I been misinformed? Yeah. Well, um, it's, I'm sure it's one of the smells that are, that are in bookstores and, and old books. But, um, when I, I mean, vanillin, when I, when I use vanillin, it's, um, usually to, yeah, for sweet, it smells like, it smells like sugar. Um, uh, when I think of bookstores, I, um, I think of, and, and old books and um, a sense of sort of like mustiness almost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's this uh, raw material, it's called Indole. Um, and uh, Eliza, do you know, do you know Indole? Um, only vaguely, like on I think I've only heard the word. Okay. 
So indole is found, um, it's naturally occurring in, in jasmine and some other white flowers, but also in feces. And it's this crazy smell that on its own, it really just smells like mothballs and old books and like cobwebs. Um, it's super musty. Um, and what if you smell it, you'll be like, oh yeah, I could see that in feces but also like I could see that in jasmine like it makes sense when you smell it but it it also does smell like bookstores um yeah I <laughs> anyway so if you uh if you ever you know want to comfort yourself maybe I can send you a little vial of indole or something because it really does smell like bookstores. oh nice <laughs> wow yeah yeah that's no oh, thank you yeah but yeah that's um that's just like one of the, the strongest like scent memories I have is is Kind of, I spent a lot of time in both comic books, comic shops, and like Borders books, etc. As as yeah. a, as a kid, um, <clears throat> and it's just a very comforting a comforting spot. The only other thing I have is like opening new magic cards. There's a specific scent and feel to those, mm -hmm. uh, which I used to do a lot of back in the day. Oh yeah, uh, but the fresh printing uh, that's kind of been sealed in by the plastic package is yeah. always nice. You get a little whiff of that. You hear smells talked about a lot in historical writing, um, memoirs of any any person who's been somewhere, particularly somewhere traumatic, will usually describe smells. Um, you know, they describe smells of concentration camps, of large fires. Um, the 9-11 attacks had a lot of smells associated with them because there was so much airborne particulate. So, I mean, if you read survivor accounts for many of this stuff, like it comes up again and again, they always, they always go back to, um, you know, I, I can't even describe to you what it smelled like, but there, you know, I'll never forget that smell. Um, it just, it just hits us. There's something about it. It just hits you like a, like a cannonball in the gut. And that can be a good thing too. I mean, sometimes it's a good smell, but, um. I don't know. I, I feel like I smell things in dreams a lot. Like I, I have dreams that are mostly mm. about being places and experiencing things in sort of a passive way. Like they don't have a lot of plot to them. But I think that, you know, smells have a lot to do with it. And I remember a lot of smells from childhood, too, because I was, I, you know, just sort of off on my own a lot. And when you're kind of just a kid sitting in the woods or whatever, you smell stuff a lot. And there are definitely yeah. smells from that where, you know, I've never been able to to find them recreated anywhere because I think maybe they were just not a stable molecule, you know, maybe not something that you could put in a bottle easily. What were some of them? Well, there was there was a tree on my block that was such a good tree that the neighbors just kind of had to give up and let the neighborhood kids climb it whenever they wanted to. It was, I think, some kind of a maple, not a sugar maple but it had the, those maple shaped leaves. It was really big, but had been trimmed down quite a bit. So it was mostly just a big thick trunk you could sort of sit on the top of, but you know, the little sprouts keep coming out of those big trunks as long as the tree is alive. And the very smallest twigs, if you took one off and then peeled off the green bark uh, that was on these very new, very fresh twigs, there was a very brief, but very strong, green uh sweet vegetation smell and the fact that it was sweets probably relates to it being a maple because maybe it did have some some sugar in the in the resin mm -hmm. um but you know even if you like rubbed it on your skin it would not stick around i can still remember exactly what it smells like but it was really uh really fleeting it it seemed to decay basically immediately and I, you know, as an adult, I've definitely heard that green sort of fresh and definitely citrus smells are difficult to make stick around for a long period of time. They, they tend to, um, yeah, to evaporate off. They're more first. volatile. Yeah. So maybe mm -hmm. it was just in that class of molecules. I don't know. I was going to say. Mm, I wish I knew what tree it was. Yeah. I think it was some kind of maple, but I'm not sure. I should go look for it. I should test you know, next time I see a tree that looks like that one. I should see if it's the same one. Yeah. I was going to say uh, for me, because we're kind of going in a circle here, I'm going to ask Ruben next sort of at gunpoint. But for me, uh, 
as a Michigan native, obviously the first gimme is everyone's going to say is the trees. But uh, personally, uh, my dad was uh, and still is to this day very big into hunting. And for me, the uh, biggest one, especially now in my older years as a writer, is blood. Blood has that specific metallic smell. And human mm-hmm. blood and deer blood smell much different. Deer are a, a much yeah. leaner animal. And it's weird. Yeah. I'm, I personally didn't like helping him clean the deer for the longest time. But, I mean, I had ate the meat and at a certain point was like, okay, you can get in on this and actually help him. And it was strange after all the blood had been drained, the meat itself self sort of had that residual metallic smell but it was like dulled it was different whereas uh human blood uh it it's very uncomfortable to smell a lot of human blood in one place uh it just it's Mm -hmm. it's thicker for some reason it has a a lingering sort of after effect and obviously for whatever reason you see a bunch of human blood like there's also just going to be whatever is going on in your brain and whatever is being released in your brain. Uh, you know, someone gets injured or this or that. But I think in terms of very punctuated smells that I can immediately think of, uh, I think of I think of the smell of uh, of sort of animal blood whenever like there's this one flower next to me I can't name to save my life, but it has this very thick metallic yet yet somehow floral uh smell and i immediately sort of think of that deer blood and that and that weird scent or like metal shavings almost Uh, it's hard to describe or articulate but like those are the point of references i use and of course it's got like these very strange reddish leaves now as time persists kind of looks like it's dying I've been watering this bad boy for a long time, but mm, I don't know what's going on with you. Mm. Sorry. I wonder if, if the smell of blood has to do with, um, or, or ties into the, uh, like the smell of a hospital. Although I'd imagine there's more sterilization going mm. on there. Um, that's one of the only other places I can think of where scent memory becomes a very big, uh, thing. Yeah. Um, Everyone hates hospital, hospital, hospital smells. Yeah. yeah, nobody likes hospital <laughs> smells. Whenever you walk into a hospital, even if it's just to visit someone, the smell will remind you of the worst time you've been in a hospital, guaranteed. Um, that is that is like the that is a big thing I was thinking about when you brought up sort of the smell of of a lot of blood in one place and also just you know stuff you experience. I, I gotta say though, maybe maybe you don't want to, but I, you have to. Writers writers smell-wise. really really milk that shit for all it's worth, like in excess. Like, <laughs> I sure. feel it almost. You can talk. My... You can talk a lot of talk about the smell of blood, or write <laughs> yeah, a lot, of write. or the taste of blood. Uh, sure, there's, sure. I mean, there's definitely also something to be said for the way that we communicate chemically to each other directly. And I think to this day, we still don't have like hard scientific evidence that humans produce pheromones. But the fact that every other mammal on Earth and like most of the other orders of animals do. I don't think that we can say that humans are special. Um, I'm pretty sure that humans produce pheromones and communicate chemically directly with each other. So, you know, it's not just the substance of the blood. It's it's or, you know, the hospital, I guess, would be a a less gross uh, example. But it's all of the people in the hospital who are upset are producing stress smells and they're producing fear smells and that has a certain scent to it. I I certainly notice that if I get really depressed, even if I take a shower, I still smell rancid. And there is a very particular type of smell that I get if I am in a really bad mental health zone for a while. And it's, it is exactly like rotting celery. That is what it smells like. You know, I think we, we compare like body odor to, you know, onions and stuff like that. But for me, it's, it's, if I smell myself, and I know that I'm, you know, not doing well in my brain, it's always rotting celery. And so those are smells that I mean, I've definitely noticed living with people, I can smell after I've lived with them for a while, I can smell if they haven't eaten recently, and they are 
uh, exuding ketones because they get that sort of like it can sometimes be a gross vinegary smell, but sometimes it smells more like a baked good. Um, so if they start to smell mm-hmm. like popcorn buttery, that's a that means that they need to eat something like they've got the ketones going or some diabetics can smell like that, too. Um, mm-hmm. But I can, you know, you get to know somebody in sort of the 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 tides and the cycles inside the domicile and smell is a big part of that. Like our parents, everybody's parents have a very specific smell to them. And the minute that you smell something that smells like your parents, you will just be slammed back to childhood. Um, you know, I've, I've had to ask boyfriends like, oh, don't wear that deodorant. It makes you smell like my dad. And that's super weird. Um, and my mom really likes, she loves Chanel number no. five. So Chanel number no. five is like the mom smell for me. Um, mm-hmm. I was going to say, uh, yeah, gr- not to not to kick the ball out of your hand immediately. I, I do want to ask Ruben. Ruben, what's Hello. your smell, dog? Um, <laughs> I would have to probably say uh, just like wood smells. If I buy any kind of uh, yeah. you give me that vibe mist kind of stuff, it would be like sandalwood plus lavender or vanilla. Oh, yeah. Anything that gets mixed with um, anything they're putting wood on there. I would kind of like a headier kind of wood smell, just like a. Like a Home Depot and lunch leftovers kind of smell. Yes. They never really go into the paint. It's always like they kind of back out with florals instead of just smelling like you shave the bark off of a, a branch and just whip it real hard. You want like a hamster cage. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> like cedar, like shaved cedar, like pencil. Oh yeah, just like that. Either not fresh sawdust because that's kind of it's kind of roasty. But just like if you've uh, if you've ever like made a walking stick and like if you carve off the bark, just stick your nose in any nearby branch. Uh, you just get that mm-hmm. real heady. I'm in the middle of Home Depot. Uh, I'm looking at the plywoods. I'm looking at their two by fours. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in what... terms of oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to ask like what specifically you wear, and everybody else. I'm curious. Uh, I uh, hmm, I just use a loose uh, handful of colognes. Most of my stuff comes from Beth, Bed, Bath and Body Works. Is that them? Yeah. Uh, just uh, whenever they have things on sale, they have like a men's line of cologne. I just have one of those laying mm-hmm. around. A couple that I've gotten as gifts from Christmas. Those are years old now. I don't know. They I don't use cologne a ton. Um, but I've moved over to either their like citrusy uh, kind of body mists that they have now. Um, so when they're on sale, it's like six bucks a bottle. So we just get a handful of those. Um, I, they had a line of ones that were like all a scent paired with a wood for a while. Um, but they dropped off that a year or two ago, I believe. Um, that was my favorite one. Mm. Uh, Jake, Michelle, what you stinking? Oh, Jake, what you stinking? Yeah. What do you smell like, bro? <laughs> Jake, you're muted. No. I don't know. Jake, we can't hear or smell Our you. Producer is dead. <clears throat> no, I just had the mute button on. Sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't looking. I, my my chair got stolen by my cat, so I'm standing up. And then I was looking at my, <laughs> I was looking at my deodorant, which is uh, the only type of fragrance that I use currently. Um, not not really up to par. Definitely not opposed to fragrances, but grew up just not being exposed to them very much. Um, but I was going to say the deodorant I use is often uh, juniper berry. Uh, scented, like kind of the the uh, Arm and Hammer naturals that they have. Um, this current one I have is Northwoods. I was looking on the back; it is only listed as natural fragrance. I oh. don't think goes, <laughs> I don't think they have to list the rest of it, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and then you know, on a day to day basis, I actually related to what Eliza said about having um, kind of like just being able to tell when I'm stressed out by smelling funkier than usual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I've definitely experienced that as well as like stress sweats in the night that you'll wake up and you'll be like, how in the world do like, do, do does the sweat smell like this? This is nuts. And then um, you'll realize it's because you're probably really stressed out about something going on in your life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. I don't have a ton to offer for that. Uh, cumulatively, I'd say I, I use cheaper lower end soaps and body washes, but I sort of, it's like the opposite of, of Pigpen from, from Charlie Brown, but like sort of similar outcomes and scents. So I, I, 
You just piled them all on. <laughs> You're just surrounded by a cloud. That's well, good. Well, all right. So I, I wash with a with an avocado <laughs> sort of scented cheap uh, body wash with the, the little scrubby thing. And then uh, for the most part, I I use this scent that's called... Oh, yeah. It, it's it, You might not have heard of this awful company. It's Axe for Her. This is probably like a really old <laughs> bottle but it's the citrus scent. <laughs> and so I will do that and I will drink. I will <laughs> Wait, did you say, did you say Axe for her? Axe for her. This is a real product that existed. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> Finally ladies. For girls. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, so. I love it. No, I honestly, I love Axe. Like I will never throw shade to Axe. So. <laughs> that's, that's actually but, awesome but, to hear. But, like that, that's pretty that's a, that's a pretty so, fun fact. I think once you become a professional perfumer, you probably ascend beyond the the petty squabbles. Of for what, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah. the cumulative smell is so. Yeah. There's like no, I don't know. I. Oh, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm really bad at not interrupting. Um, mm -hmm. No, I was just gonna say I have so much love for Axe. Like, I don't know. People love to hate on Axe, but I just like. I feel like it's such an important perfume. It's like really the only fragrance that's like filling the hole for like basically, I don't know, teenage boys who are like, you know, between the ages of like 12 and like 17. Mm -hmm. um, and they just like always overdo it. And I think it's hilarious. And also it doesn't actually like, smell bad if you smell it on a blotter um I feel like they're usually pretty well done they're just really potent and people who wear it, wear it like tend to overspray it I don't know I think Axe is really fun and I like I love it but I had no idea that they had a for her uh, line also yeah there there were there were there's this weird sort of pine e each variation has a form of citrus but like the user the user is like always wearing it, doing stuff. So I end up smelling like like three things. I smell like cigarettes. I smell like black coffee, <laughs> and I smell like that. So I can immediately tie that to I vaguely smell like a convenience store to anyone I meet, like <laughs> you know, through no fault of my own. Uh, but well, actually, it's all my fault. But the key the key ingredients the key are all ingredients there. are all there and it's 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 i think it's just out of convenience it's relatively cheap and it's loud it's the it's one of the loudest scents i i can think of save like the old 1980s ones i'm actually working on a bodega smell right now oh my god <laughs> Oh, that's very serendipitous. <laughs> Have you had to yeah. go outside of your usual repertoire to kind of nail that or to kind of get started on that? Uh, yeah. Of, of smells, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had to use smells that I like haven't actually purchased um, for my lab, but I remember from the lab at Jividon, um, like I was like, there was this one smell that kind of smelled like dog breath that I remember. And then I like remembered what it was and I ordered it. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't really smell like dog breath, but it smells kind of like a dirty refrigerator in a bodega. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. Because it's just got all the different frozen things in it. And they've, they've all been in there for how who knows how long. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I feel like bodegas smell like um refrigerators like old refrigerators kind of rotten bananas and mm -hmm. like maybe some fresh artificial flowers right yeah the rotten you, banana like... smell is so interesting because that's um that's ethylene i think ethylene gas i mean obviously it's a bunch of different molecules but one of the things that we use bananas for when we like put bananas in a bag with other fruit to make them ripen is that's the ethylene gas that forces the ripening so one of the mm. theories about about the um uh the oracle at uh, at delphi was that ethylene gas was coming from the cave system below the temple and ethylene gas will get you high high mm. like fucked up high so 
it's wild to me to think about, you know, this smell that we all are aware of with, you know, the, the ripe banana smell, that sort of alcohol tang, um, being used as a way to talk to God, you know, if, if this is, if this theory about the, the Oracle temple complex is true, then it means the whole place smelled like rotten bananas. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And and you know this woman was she would be put over she would be put on a tripod seat over a crack in the earth and this ethylene gas would billow out and she would breathe it in and just go into a into a trance. Um, wow. Yeah, it's I, I've often wondered like could you get because they use ethylene gas in in canisters to force fruit ripening on an industrial scale so definitely you can buy it like you could buy it in a can. <laughs> I kind of wonder why it's not a um like a party drug you know yeah i was about to say a recreational <laughs> yeah, you know, get yeah. around with the friends have some uh prophetic visions right it's probably not expensive not if they use it for industrial agriculture yeah that's yeah. kind of i've heard that about the oracle in the past that's wild to think about what uh What's well, I think you're the last in our scent rodeo, though, Eliza. What do you got on your on your shelf these days? I actually smell bad most of the time. Um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm just sort of, I'm sort of a person who smells bad. I think my whole family smells bad, actually. But I don't go out very much, and I'm not around people. So when I do, I I take care to not stink because um, I do stink otherwise. My favorite perfumes, I think, actually are. They're both Dior, and one of them is Eau Noir, and one of them is um, Amber Nuit. And we got them, I, my brother and I bought them in a mall in Philadelphia, I think. And we have sort of treasured these two bottles between us and sort of shared them and parceled them out for years afterwards. And I think both are very... Um, I'm probably going to be wrong if I name any individual notes because I just don't know. I just don't know perfume notes very well, but I think they're both pretty woodsy and spicy. And mm-hmm. uh, of course, everybody likes this one, but I do really like uh, Replica, Margiela Replica by The Fireplace. Um, it was a smash hit, however, so, you know, I'm not special for for liking that one. But that one's just like really woodsy and um it's it's literally it smells like sitting by a fireplace with a chunk of cedar in it that's it is yeah the i mean we were talking about memory margiella has done a whole line called replica that's specifically memory based and so they you know they've got one for sailing they've got one for beach which smells like you know sunscreen and They've got one for barbershops. They've got another for a jazz club. They've got a music festival one, which faintly smells of weed. Mm. Um, They're all really, really well done. Uh, And they're also, of course, extremely fucking expensive. Um, (laughs) And then I I really like this. There's this one super cheap one, which I was introduced to by one of the other models backstage at a photo shoot I was at. And of course, the backstages at photo shoots are usually just a mess, like li- literally and metaphorically, because there's always there's always a girl who's crying on the phone to her boyfriend. There's always somebody who needs a ride. There's always somebody who's strung out or hung over. Um, that that sort of reputation of of modeling is definitely true. But uh, one of the more experienced girls at the shoot smelled amazing and i'm like you smell absolutely incredible what are you wearing and she says i am wearing body fantasies from the drugstore <laughs> um, and i think it was i there are a bunch of them i think her the one she's wearing was called twilight but i think they changed its name later like they kept the formulation but it's called i don't know it's got some other stupid name now it's not like it's like bit of vanilla kisses or something just the trashiest four or five dollars a bottle body spray but there is something about it it is a magical smell and men really like it there's a whole class of perfumes that you wear for men because men straight men i should specify straight men really have usually terrible taste in perfumes and and body smells because they just don't have the mileage right like they don't they can't tell that you're wearing dior they don't give a shit. Right. They, they don't. They don't know what an expensive perfume smells like, so they're just not making that judgment. They just react to mostly food smells. 
um because i think that that's the majority of their that. yeah the majority of their scent memories are based around food for i think probably obvious reasons so strippers and models and anytime when you're like go-go yeah. dancing or interacting with men in a customer service capacity wearing something like body fantasies twilight is going to do a lot of work for you they love it so there are, there's like a whole class of perfume i think of as perfume that you wear for men like to influence men or to to catch their attention or something like that and for some reason also um the the pan cheap pantene conditioner um men love that they go crazy for the cheap pantene conditioner i can't tell you how many times i have curly hair so i use like cheap leave in mm. conditioner a lot and it's pantene is great because it's all loaded up with shitty waxes and silicones and stuff so it's great if you're if your hair is frizzy it's good but men love it if you're in a car with a dude and you're wearing like the pantene pro v five dollar conditioner leave in um they're always like what what perfume are you wearing i want to buy it for my wife that's <laughs> one i've heard a lot i want to buy the perfume that you're wearing for my wife how's that gonna go dude are you gonna go home and be like you're never gonna believe this but this stripper I met was wearing this great perfume, so I got you some. Like, no. I, I think they, they probably don't say those exact words, but um yeah. So there there is a whole there's a whole class of smell where I think of like, how am I interacting with men while I'm wearing this? And yeah. it's it's like a combination smell of can I stand to smell like this? And men are going to really like this. And you don't want to waste your Margiela when you're go-go dancing because you're just going to sweat it off. <laughs> you want something yeah. shitty. Uh, just to... Yeah, I also feel like Angel, the perfume Angel, is sort of the epitome of um, of that sort of edible mm -hmm. gourmand, like vanilla smell. But yes. definitely like Victoria's Secret, Amber Romance, and... Mm -hmm. Even some early ones from the Body Shop and Bath and Body Works, like those were all like the pear. Do you remember the pear? That one was my favorite. Um, oh no, I don't. Yeah, those, I that one. Yeah, it was called like Pear Glossé, <laughs> and it was it was um, it was a Victoria's Secret like splash. It was an early one. Um, I highly recommend it if you ever come across it. But Victoria's yeah, I feel Secret's like those, the yeah. That's the perfect example of like where yeah. men's and women's tastes have to overlap because a dude walks into Victoria's Secret on Valentine's Day to buy yeah. a present. So you have these products. That's one of the reasons I think Victoria's Secret produces so much crap is because they're not selling to women. Yeah. They're, they're selling these things to men who are buying them as gifts. So true. Yeah. Yeah. It's always the very, like you said, the pronounced um <laughs> like fruity sense where you can't help but smell it and so i think that's i think that is like to a lot of especially a lot of straight dudes it's like that's the only thing that forces their brain to acknowledge a type of smell right and they also probably you know when they were 10 had a sense experience with like strawberry chapstick on a girl that they had a crush on that they may not even remember oh sure but those those kind of childhood smells are I think probably some of the strongest scent memories that that men have, because I think women usually as they grow up get a lot of other smells and other scent memories that sort of override those earlier ones or uh, make them more complex. But yeah, most, also most men have, have men have the attachment to their mothers and their mothers were always, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think a lot of mothers were cooking a lot. For them, and they associate cooking smells with their mother. So, um, yeah, yeah. And I most, think that's most people's accurate. moms are not wearing Chanel Number no. Five. Most of them are wearing white diamonds or white shoulders or you know mm -hmm. Jordana or whatever. White so. white diamond is that the is that the the, the Taylor the one? Taylor. With, yeah. It's got a very yeah. <laughs> alcohol sort of heavy smell. Or am I getting that wrong? It's very aldehydic, mm. um, has lots of aldehydes um, and aldehydes. I always explain them. Aldehydes are so hard to explain, but um, they really smell like 
if you take an iron, um, like in an ironing board and you heat it up really hot and then you put it on top of, you know, a shirt or whatever, and then mm. you, you pull it off. It's like the steam combined with kind of like a, like a wet fabric. Um, wow. it's really hard to explain, but it, it's a little bit citrusy. It's definitely waxy. Um, but aldehyde Chanel, Chanel number five has that, um, sort of infamous overdose of aldehyde. So mm-hmm. Chanel number no. five, if you know what that smells like, that's very aldehydic. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, they're usually kind of perfumes with a lot of aldehydes are usually like old fashioned smelling quote unquote. Um, but definitely white diamonds has a lot of aldehydes. Mm-hmm. I've actually been smell. I mean, I've been wearing the, the winter sample set that I got from you mostly. Um, I'm probably mm-hmm. going to have to get full bottles of those. I want to do more perfume. I I just, I don't have got, I've got like a very small collection and I'd like it to be bigger. Um, Cause it's Which a good ones? investment, you know, for yourself. Yeah, for sure. Which got, ones are your favorite? I haven't decided yet. I'm still working on that. I don't know if I have favorites cause I, I really, I'm enjoying all of them um, on their, on their different merits. Uh, it was, Black Jasmine Tea, Petrichor, Honey Rose, and Mimosa. I can't remember what the the modifier for Mimosa was, but those were the four. Yeah. And they're they're fantastic. I always notice especially how the Mimosa scent does have a very strong it it smells like Mimosa the drink when it opens. <laughs> For uh-huh. for me anyway, uh, it, for some reason for me it hits me with the the citrus alcohol like almost the screwdriver smell um, before it kind of settles in, and I love that. Like every time I put it on, it it surprises me. Um, but yeah, I've just I've been I've been really loving those. But I I'm, I'm so definitely going to order the new ones and give those uh, give those a try as well because I I love that you've named you've done two perfumes now of famous. Uh, historical female figures. Um, actually, yes. I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the Redmond's collection is a little bit separate from my freelance projects, but they're all available on the same website. Um, but I just kind of like to keep them separate. The price point is a little bit higher and there's um, generally the formulas are more expensive and I spend more time on them. Um, but honestly, that's not even totally true. I just, I like to keep them separate from my other projects that are more fleeting. Um, and yeah, so rediments, um, um, the word rediments is derived from the word redimency, which means the act of loving in return. And I started the project because I originally started wearing perfume based on Um, how my grandmother who passed away wore Shalimar. So when I was 12 years old, I started wearing Shalimar and it was a way for me to connect with her um, after her passing. And, you know, I always think that perfume is necromancy and um, that is certainly how I started wearing it. And I think also, why that sort of natural tie between, you know, the history of cemetery construction and and perfumery um, was so appealing to me. So um, the idea for Rediments was to sort of find these women from history who uh, just I really, prior to doing my research, didn't know anything about, but were definitely like worth knowing um, and try and honestly like fantasize about them a little and like think about them and in a way that wasn't necessarily like I would say that a lot of people like ask specifically like do the smells represent certain things in their lives or like how did you come up with the smells to represent them mm-hmm. um, they are olfactive portraits but I think for me what was most important was like you know, I would do some research, like Queen Nzinga, I would find some, you know, plants and um, just smells that would have been around her, um, sort of for inspiration, but then also think of sort of who she was. Um, 
and try and represent that more um, sort of just less literally. So, you know, there was tamarind where she was. So I, I, you know, the main note is tamarind, um, but really I wanted it to be just sort of a very regal um, amber, like a sparkling, um, beautiful, like deep yellow, orange, amber with um, some, I like, <laughs> there was something, um, she was, you know, she was a queen, but she was also, she fought like on the front lines with her people. There was something um, kind of uh, masculine about her in this way. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to make the top note kind of like an old school aftershave. Um, <laughs> smell. Yeah. So it has, it has like geranium, um, and it is, it is the perfume that I wear. Um, just like if I'm going out, um, it's my favorite perfume I've ever made. And, um, I, I love it. Um, I also, you know, and then Ching Shi was the, you know, she was one of the most, if not the most, um, important pirate pirates, like in the history of piracy, um, and I mean, her life is incredible. I really recommend you Google Ching Shi um, mm-hmm. and read about her. Um, and yeah, she's one of yeah. my favorites. I, I have kind of a passion for for pirates in general, but yeah, female pirates uh, in particular. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I, I was really <laughs> excited. I was really excited to to see that you had done something with her, and I'm excited to try it as well. Yeah. And then I'm about to launch, um, probably later this year, um, Imperia La Divina, who was sort of, um, she was a 15th century Roman courtesan. Um, She was sort of the first celebrity courtesan ever. Um, She made a career, I mean, a really like, she had a really um, luxurious life. Her funeral was one of the largest parties Rome had ever seen. Um, she would stand in the window of her, of her home and pose and, um, like in lingerie and basically charge people to walk down the street. Um, (laughs) (laughs) that's great. Yeah. That's a good hustle right there. Yeah. And she had like this really extensive list of, um, you know, the qualities that like her Johns needed to have. So, um, yeah, she um, was just pretty amazing. And I, I really want to do like sort of a deep rose perfume for her. I've, you know, stayed away from rose, but um, I really want to do that for her. So I'm excited. I thought your honey rose was really good. <laughs> that was me kind of um, warming up to rose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm think glad I, you liked I, it though. I share your... Um, I don't even know if apprehension is the right word, but rose rose seems tricky. Like I've tried to wear rose a lot because, you know, mm-hmm. I love how they smell outside, but it's so hard to like translate that into a body smell for some reason without just it going so wrong. <laughs> totally. And I'm not I, I've never been quite sure what the what the problem was. Um but I thought the I honey rose was really good. Cool. I'm glad. Yeah. I, um, I spent a lot of time on that one, but yeah, I just think rose can go wrong so easily. Like if roses, if, if it's like a good rose and, or if it's like a perfect rose smell, then it, it hits really hard. But if it's not good, it's not good. It can go wrong very easily. That's what I feel about it. Yeah, it can. It's, I don't know. It, like, it still smells like a rose, but there's just something, something wrong about it. I actually knew a girl in, in community college who um, wore a rose perfume and it, it just smelled like roses on her. Like it was working for her. Mm. And I think it might have just been she just got lucky and got a really good essential oil or something like that. Because sometimes you do. Sometimes you just get something from the food co-op and it's just exactly the yeah. right thing. And if you go back, sometimes it's just a different batch or maybe it hasn't aged enough on the shelf or, you know, all sorts of stuff can go wrong. It's so sensor unstable. Um, yeah. but sometimes you get lucky and you just, you get, you get the right bottle of something. And that was kind of the first time I was like, Oh wow. Yeah. Rose perfume. And then after that, I've kind of been looking for one, um, ever I since. I really love, um, Red Roses by Joe Malone. It really smells like red roses. It's not sweet and it's not really, you know how the honey rose in the sample bag is a little bit, um, 
it's definitely like rich. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, Red Roses is not rich. It's more fresh, but it's still, it's Mm. just a really beautiful rose perfume. It's probably the only one I would wear. I've heard it recommended before and I'm definitely intending to to pick it up and and test it out. I think I should just probably, I think I have sort of decided I'm going to buy like one perfume per month, you know, and, Mm -hmm. um, and kind of slowly start a collection that way. Cause it's just, I never regret it. You know, even if the perfume doesn't work out for me when it first arrives, sometimes it grows on me and I always appreciate it having it around later. Yeah. I know what you mean. Wait, question. This is completely out of context, but did you go to Seattle Central? Yes. So did I. (laughs) I didn't know you went to Seattle. (laughs) I lived in Seattle for like a year and a half and I went to Seattle Central in like 2010, 2011. I don't remember when I went. I think I I went before (laughs) then because it would have been, it would have been earlier. It would have been because I think I was already in the Bay Area by 2010. But yeah, I was at Seattle Central for, I don't know, a year or something. Um, The girl I knew at the Rose Perfume may have been in a different community college because I was, I started going to college early when I was in high school uh, Mm because they they had a, they had a nice program where you could start getting college credit early for free if you were like a really nerdy high school student. (laughs) (laughs) So, so yeah, I started going to community college in my hometown um, in Bellingham. Bellingham actually was a stinky city for a long time because we had a paper mill there until oh, wow. fairly recently. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we also we also have Tacoma, which has I forget what, but some sort of factory that causes it. What what is often referred to as the Tacoma aroma. Yes. Yes, Tacoma. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. What is oh, it? What was that? That's really funny about Seattle Central, though. Like, Seattle is truly a small town. I don't really care what anyone yeah. says. It is. I always know people that know people here. Um, I've also lived. I've lived next to that campus almost the whole time I was. Uh, I was here. Oh or I've wow! Been here. I, yeah, I lived on Boylston. Oh. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. They... I live on Fourteenth and John. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, maybe might bleep that out. We'll see. They also, <laughs> yeah, they. have Tacoma also has a paper mill, but they also have like really big tide flats. So I think it's a combination paper mill and uh, and low tide. That sounds terrible. I don't know if I've ever been in Tacoma during low tide. Hmm. It was interesting. I was having a conversation a couple days ago with someone and he was he was talking about how there has been sort of a resurgence in, in academic writing about um uh, just sort of about places that are that have moved from centers of cities to the outskirts and so they were just they were talking to me about you know obviously cemeteries but then I guess there have been there have been a lot of cases of fish markets um moving from centers of cities to the outskirts Mm. um I guess there was one recently in in Japan um that like a big fish market that, you know, was in the center of the city and everyone would go to that was moved and people were really upset about it um, because it was such a part of daily life. And um, I don't know, I was just thinking about the fish market in Seattle and how that market, I I could be wrong, but that market didn't really smell to me. Um, But please tell me if I'm incorrect. But I was also thinking of like just how much I love New York because I was thinking of Chinatown and, you know, there's fish markets all over Chinatown. Right. Chinatown is so stinky. Like it smells like, like dried fish actually. Um, I think dried fish smells so much more intense than, than fresh fish. Um, but like Chinatown is never going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I was just like kind of grateful for that. But um, does the fish market smell in Seattle? Not at all. They yeah, they, would, uh, they would not be able to have it be so touristy if it mm-hmm. smelled. I yeah. mean, it's it's really open air, and there's only a few yeah. stalls. Yeah, for fish, a lot of it fish. is other stuff. Yeah, and most of it is just other stuff. So I I'm sure they probably have some secret rules that we don't know about that's keeping it mm. tourist friendly. Because if it was a real fish market, and yeah, certainly if you walk up right to the fish place you can smell some fish but it's not like the the one in uh tokyo you mentioned was the tsukiji fish market and that used to be the reason that got moved as far as i understand was that uh the tourist attraction element became too much for the people actually Mm. doing business there yeah 
Um, and that is one of the reasons it had to be relocated. Uh, but it was very much the type of place where, yeah, it was you, you could go there at 4.35 a.m. and just see people, like, chucking in giant tuna um, and cutting yeah. them up and selling them to, to people at auction. Seattle is also cold. So we, yeah. I don't think we get this. We don't get the same concentration of smell. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the market being right on the sea. It's like, right there on the bay. Uh, you, yeah. just, you just smell the sea. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's always windy and cold down at Pike Place. Even yeah. even during the summer, it's windy and cold like because it's the piers right there. So I don't think the stink could even really stick around if it was there. I think that might change. I mean, climate change is a basically destroyed seattle summer we we have really bad summer weather now and we have a fire season now too which is great oh yeah yeah we've we've got we now have wildfires in british columbia and then all the way down the coast that get yeah the smoke gets blown directly into seattle it was really bad a few years ago but it's um Uh, yeah probably past three years that there have been issues in california we have seen the effects of that up here for sure yeah it's almost every year now, and pretty soon it's going to be every year. And of course, nobody has air conditioning because it's Seattle. So you can't like go into a business yeah. and get air conditioning the way that you can on the East Coast. So it's it's pretty bad here. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. I mean, I remember my apartment in Seattle didn't have air conditioning, and I was like, "What?" That's, yeah. That, so I moved out here from Atlanta, and that blew my mind mm-hmm. like at every every yeah. building out here i would go into and there's just be no air conditioning no air conditioning and, and no screens on the windows that too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i had to buy a screen for my, so for my like bedroom window <laughs> um we, it is we, it is very interesting yeah we didn't really have summer and we don't really have a lot of bugs either but we will <laughs> right right yeah, yeah it's getting like summer's getting hotter and hotter for yeah. sure up here it's getting bad. Um, a little more akin to, to New York, as, as I understand. My sister lived there for a, a hot bit, too. Um, mm. But it always feels like, yeah, like when it's ridiculously hot out up here, it's it's usually similar up there. It's on also the, uh, not the equator humid line. here. It, it rains all the time, so people assume that it's humid, but it's never muggy the way that it is on the East Coast. Like the, yeah. the New York summer, you have to like swim down the sidewalk. It is so humid and you just sweat and the sweat does not evaporate and that's how it is in you know the east and south of the united states but yeah we just don't have that here even though it rains all the time it's never muggy so i think you know that means smells don't stick around if there's a smell it doesn't get it doesn't like concentrate in a wet air and it yeah. doesn't have a lot of legs to it because it just it evaporates so quickly and those molecules just fly apart so fast. Yeah, having grown up with like very extreme humidity in the south and and also like kind of the smells associated with that, right? Because you mm-hmm. go out, everything's sweaty. Um the cars are like toasting, so when you get in your car it just smells like roasted leather or roasted whatever's mm-hmm. whatever your seats are made out of. God forbid they're leather or they're going to burn your skin. Yeah. Um Whereas up here, when people complain about humidity, I just like chuckle and I go, "What are you talking about?" Yeah, because it's <laughs> yeah, it's like sixty percent humidity in there, right? Or whatever, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know a lot of a lot of Pacific Northwesterners have never lived anywhere else, so they just <laughs> it's true. They yeah. like it's truly a bubble weather wise up here. Yeah, but it, it does really change the smells. Um, I, I used to travel to Florida and Hawaii when I was a kid because that's just where my grandparents lived, respectively. And I love getting off the plane mm. and the smell of wherever you are just yeah. hits you like a wall. It's so, I love that. I love, and I mean, in Hawaii, of course, it's unbelievably good. Like Hawaii just right. smells good all the time, everywhere, constantly. Mm-hmm. But anywhere you go, just, I love that stepping off the plane and there's that new air and all of the smells in it. And of course, you're not used to it yet. So you really get to experience it so strongly for a few minutes. Um, it's best if you like get to debark onto the onto the runway. But yeah. uh, <laughs> it's even individual airports have different smells. Oh, I, I, I yeah. agree. I, it's one of the it's one of the more like I think it's the one of the more impactful parts of travel, because especially mm-hmm. nowadays, you know, a lot of cities at the end of the day, um, they, they, you know, the, the shot for shot, they'll look they'll look very similar, but they'll smell very different. Yeah. Get off the plane, 
as you said, um, you'll immediately understand you're in a different spot, even if you see all the same types of uh, buildings that were, you know, where you just were. Mm -hmm. um, sort of as a segue, though, or, or more of a point that I had when you were talking about Rose earlier, Marissa, are there any other sense that you kind of like either see as a challenge or see as like, oh, I've, that's overrated. I'm never going to use that or some sort of mixture of that feeling? Mm. There are certain scents that I resist for various reasons, either because I don't know exactly how to do them and I have to spend time figuring it out, um, which is basically just me resisting like a challenge because I'm lazy. Um, mm. <laughs> I mean, but, hey, I'm no one's really lazy, but <laughs> the fact that you know seeing it as a challenge is definitely kind of what I was what I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, so there's either there there are either scents that I <clears throat> view as a challenge, and you know, usually like I would say I'm more excited to do them than resistant. But there, you know, I am generally resistant. I have to do research and look in my formulas book and figure out, you know, how am I going to make this. Um, look at sort of an example and a chord and then figure out sort of how to make it mine. Um, and it always takes a while, um, but it is really, um, um, oh, what's the word? Sorry, I'm having, um, it is really satisfying once I'm done with it. I think also I resist um, sense that I, that I find to be cliche. Um, like, I don't know, I, um, you you probably saw on on my social media maybe not but um i recently launched a cake perfume it was um for my for my friend yeah. um for my close friend That's nice. um yeah it's called annabelle's birthday cake it's for annabelle gat um who's an astrologer and she her birthday was is actually the day after mine in march and so we we launched this birthday cake perfume. Um, and I, she really wanted to do a birthday cake perfume. And I, I was a little bit like, mm, I, okay, but like, do you, do you think people are going to like want <laughs> right. that? Like, I don't know. Like, um, and she was like, no, she was like, I really like want a birthday cake perfume. And I was like, okay, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm going to really just like, um, do this. And, so I was thinking like, okay, how do I create a birthday cake perfume that doesn't smell like cheap or disgusting or overly sweet? So I kind of like made it a challenge um, in my own mind. I'm actually so happy with it. And I think it's really pretty and I would wear it. So, and I really didn't think not to like to my own horn, but really like I was, I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and it's very, um, it, it does smell like cake, but almost in kind of a light um ethereal way and it's not super sweet i used um tonka instead of like sort of cheap vanilla um and it has this note that smells like rubber balloons it's um kind of crazy and um yeah so i think i don't know just i guess it's just a reminder that, you know, there really are sort of the same perfumers doing the same things in just different iterations over and over and over again. So there really is so much possibility in perfume and in perfumery. And I feel lucky to have the knowledge to to do that and, and also the ability to um, take it in these new directions. Um, I wish I had the like, I don't know, just um, financial, like, um, dependence of a job, you know, like I had, but I do also feel like, okay, like I'm doing it, like it's hard, but um, I think this last year I started to get more orders than I've really ever had and um, started to just feel more confident in not really my ability to be a perfumer, but also to run a business, like to go to the post office. I mean, just, it's literally just me like running to the post office every day and packing stuff. And, um, so it, it is tricky to do the creative work and also just the, the other, all, everything else that needs to happen. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. It's awful. I hate it every day. Every day I'm like, <laughs> oh God, I have to mail stuff or I yeah. have to, answer emails or whatever it's yeah. it's awful uh, success to me is is like getting to the point where i can just hire as many of my friends as possible to do that stuff for me <laughs> same 
that's my <laughs> idea of success. Yeah, me too. No, thank you. Thank you. That's like, I mean, the cake is like a perfect answer for, for what I was kind of wondering about with regards to kind of how you meet challenges or how you get, how you deal with stuff that's maybe not what you had in mind, but, but is, is definitely doable. And you know, you have sort of the repertoire, you know, your, your comparison to writing and, and in my mind uh, to music, it also works. Like everyone yeah. has the same bank of vocabulary words or the same bank of musical notes, or in your case, the same bank of, you know, knowledge about, about sense. And, and the tools that come with that. Um, mm -hmm. And it is just a matter of the brain that it's getting processed through and, and kind of how that gets, how that can get translated. Oh, yeah. I, I love also that, you know, it doesn't just smell like cake. It smells like the party. Right. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty genius. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ruben, yeah. what were you saying? Oh, yeah, I said a quick follow-up, kind of similar to Jake's, um, like what are cliche smells and the like there. Uh, as you know, in social media, a lot of people would talk shit about things do you do you ever see like feedback about sense that is either just kind of outrageous uh in general or things people would say um that isn't real criticisms yeah what pisses you off on the internet <laughs> um that's a good question a lot of things well i don't know i'm an aries i get really easily annoyed in general but um like quick to temper but um no i think like on the internet, what annoys me is people who kind of um, think they know a lot about perfume and um, and don't. But really, honestly, like I'm usually just grateful that there is any type of discussion about scent um, on the internet, even if it's negative. Um, I don't know. People love to talk shit about Suntall 33, which I kind of think is hilarious just because that smell is fucking everywhere and it literally smells like pickles. Um, but like all, of, all of Soho smells like Suntall 33. It's like literally like wafting out of hotels, like, and I'm just so tired of it. And so anyway, um, there's that, I guess, um, I've never heard anybody talking shit about my perfumes, but I'm curious if they are, <laughs> I don't know. Does that answer your question? Oh yeah, that's pretty good. And a uh, second would be uh, unrelated follow up, but uh, in general, the idea that uh, scents are perfumes, uh, olfactory items are memories in a way. Are there any scents that you would say would be the best for forgetting? Hmm. Ooh. Like, uh, <laughs> what's what is the anti scent? What is the counter to this? Smells like uh, my grandma's baked goods, and is more like this makes you forget uh people i don't want to see anymore nice <laughs> the sense of oblivion <laughs> that's a good ass question that is that's a pretty interesting one yeah god um okay the only answer i can come up with right now i feel like i'm gonna need to think about this would be something just like really crazy and potent like opium um, so you like, basically like if you were to spray it all around you, you might like pass out or something. Wait, does opium have a scent or do you mean spray opium into the air and then inhale it? <laughs> oh, it, it's a, sorry, it is a perfume. It's a perfume. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Very strong. It's scent. a perfume. That's very strong and spicy and, um, it, it kind of makes people choke. I think, um, a perfume like that would make you forget, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's almost but like it's a smelling so salt effect. Yeah, totally. Exactly. It's it's really hard though, because even if, you know, I think of a perfume that maybe just smells like incense or something um, to help you forget and um, I don't know, maybe like be mesmerized or something. Like um, it's even incense has, you know, I think it's different for different people. So incense for me like i didn't grow up going to church so i don't associate it with that i associate it more with like new age um i don't know practices um i just think it's it would depend on the person oh, yeah. do you have a um do you have an idea of of something uh no i i was just trying to uh be is antithetical the word i was just trying to be <laughs> to have perfume be uh inverted and the idea of instead of it uh being something that you 
yeah. uh, want to be around or makes you uh, think of someone that you like or something like that, of like a smell that kind of neutralizes all thought in a way. I would use like an ozone, I think. To, to me, that's like, I don't know, it's, it's the, the, the ozone smell is... It's sort of a feeling of, of nullification, but it also kind of, I mean, we use ozone to kind of neutralize other smells in actual, like, cleaning mm -hmm. and stuff. There's there's something, I don't, I think it's kind of pseudoscience in some ways, but yeah, um, ionized, ionized particles are supposed to, like, stick to smell molecules and um, neutralize odors. So I think an ozone-based perfume, you could do something like that in sort of a talismanic sense it wouldn't operate the same way but right. uh this the smell of ozone is kind of the smell of sterility which mm. is sort of a, an obliterating um concept for me i think i could choose a like yeah. i think i could choose like a rye sourdough maybe that hasn't really been associated with many memories other than me making some bread mm -hmm. so that could mm. just be kind of like a neutral space the switzerland of smell the idea of a smell that centers you is interesting to me. Like, like kind of what I was talking about at the beginning with, with just like being in a bookstore type of smell. Um, not necessarily a scent you wear, but something you get out of a location you go to, to kind of put you back in a, in a, in a calm space. Oh, I think I, wait. Yeah. I, think I, have I guess I here. just feel like it's different for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, like, like we've said a couple of times, it's so scent seems like such a very personally encoded thing. We can all smell the same stuff, but we're never going to have like, you know, mm -hmm. the exact same reaction, I suppose. And then I've definitely bought perfumes before where I was like, this perfume makes me feel like there are a lot of possibilities associated with this perfume that I have not experienced yet. Mm -hmm. So I've definitely mm -hmm. treated perfume that way. And I yeah, do know, I always... um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, in terms of, uh, it's kind of like if you get commissioned for doing smells or whatever, is there a commission you didn't want to follow through or a smell someone tried to pitch you uh, that, not that it wasn't coming together, but you just weren't really into the idea or something like that? Any weird uh, stories for that? Um, yes, I have a really good one. <laughs> I don't feel, I don't feel like I can share it. Just, in, I don't know, this person is kind of, uh, who suggested Yeah, it. we don't want to, no worries on that front. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you guys after. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. The cake story was a pretty good example of, of, a, of, of that in, in effect, though, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. With it working or, out. Or uh, no one. Oh, I did have one, um instance of, of of a woman who approached me who wanted to make a scent um inspired by the smell of a braid of her grandmother's hair that she had cut off like right after she died whoa um yeah wow. and she had just kept specific. this it was very specific yeah and she had just kept this braid in a plastic bag um but she would open it and smell it and it would smell like her grandmother and um so she asked me if I could recreate that and I said I could try um we haven't started yet um but Ooh. yeah that's pretty cool. yeah I think um, progress. I would love to do that honestly it's like a little it's a little creepy but I I also I think it's kind of beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah no, I, I get it, especially in the in the idea of of scent being memory, and even as you said, I I think the coolest thing. I'm still trying to figure out a way to 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 make perfume is necromancy into the title of the episode somehow. <laughs> um, I think that's the coolest thing you've said mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, there's like a few you could go with. Seems like the 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 snappiest would be like scent of the dead, but then you know. Oh, I'll figure something out. Don't worry about it. But uh, <laughs> but the the point of it is is very uh, very salient and very like it 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 makes a lot of sense in my head. Sense. <clears throat> <laughs> oh God, no, that was not even Sorry. intended. But we'll, we'll no, we'll take those. We take those one hundred percent. Yeah. Um. In terms. In terms of a. Uh... In terms of what you'd like to do within your uh, 
field, like in the future, uh, uh, where do you see, do you see your, do you see your body of work going? It's, it's kind of interesting to learn that there's an editorial and creative process involved with, uh, the creation of sense and all of this forethought, uh, what, what do you, what do you see in terms of, uh, what you'd like to do in the future, uh, with, uh, with what you do with your work, uh, what does that look like for you? Thank you. I really appreciate this question. Um, I would really like to um, be commissioned by a large brand um, to who could, you know, just pay me for my time, but then would be able to manufacture and produce the bottles themselves um, and distribute them just because that's the part for me that's so time consuming. Um, I just want to spend my time writing formulas. So I guess more broadly, I would just like to do work that doesn't require me going to the post office every day and filling bottles and doing all that kind of manual labor, Um, just writing formulas and sending them to, you know, a larger lab where they can then, fill the bottles, um, and ship them out themselves. Um, that's sort of a long-term goal, but I also, um, you know, I do really miss writing and I, um, I don't know sort of what role writing is going to play in in my life. Like I, I miss academia to a certain extent, like I definitely don't, but I also do. And, um, I've, I've been writing a lot of poetry, I think like, um, and I've been, I've been published a little bit last year. Poetry has always been a huge part of my life. So I think more specifically to answer, to answer your question, um, just be able to sort of figure out how to freelance, um, more effectively and also have time for my writing. Would be goals. Ah, yeah, it's, it's a, it writing, writing right now is in flux. Uh, a lot of people are sort of trying to do a sort of neo blogging through uh Substack and uh, platforms like that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting slash sometimes disheartening, but it, but it also will show how people kind of adjust to the times. Uh, uh, we we are Mel. Uh, uh, Mel, uh, those folks shut down, and they're they're kind of looking to reorient and have a a new buyer to kind of do their thing. I didn't even know they were owned by Dollar Shave Club until the shutdown happened. <laughs> I thought that was a joke. <laughs> wow, it's it's actually true. And this, this is, this was like a outlet that I think like was a pretty consistent commissioner of, uh, like, like six of the, well, trans people that are allowed to write, I guess, in the nicest way I could say this, there's a bit of a weird access culture in writing, but, uh, in term, in terms of that, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really also sometimes who you know, where you've been published, and whether or not you have a good enough relationship with your editor after X amount of publications have folded. Uh, Most of the places I have wrote at have folded. A lot of places were dependent on individual donations or VC funding, uh, which it's, it's, I'm not trying to scare you away from it. Poetry, poetry and academia, uh, probably have better inroads there as far as that goes uh just because it's a a lot more of a fluid space and it has a lot of scenes as it relates to publishing but uh in the in the current moment it's it's all over the place it's sort of exciting but i am happy i just work on comics i don't know if i personally would do article writing or the like in in the ways of the past possibly blogging but that's more of an aside (laughs) yeah i my long form writing is is very specific and not particularly like um publishable i don't know i've been trying to place this one essay because i'm i'm also um just a really intense 
fan of Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I loved her since I was in second grade. And I've written this long essay about her history of uh, throat injuries um, that I've been trying to place and nobody wants it. So I'm just like, whatever. I'm only going to write what I want to write. Um, so maybe I'll never, you know, I don't know be a known writer, but um, you know, I just do it because I love it. So. I mean, I mean, there there are places for sort of, uh, I want to say, because it sort of seems like a specific sense of ephemera uh, and small press. Uh, so, I mean, that's always a thing. Anthologies are always interesting for those sort of uh, very particular and hyper-focused sort of works. And I, I'm trying to remember trying to remember uh this one anthology i was reading where someone was just tying their trauma to like eating eggs and eggs specifically being this massive psychological trigger to them that you never would have associated with it which is nuts but then yeah that's one of the interesting parts of uh small press uh that said uh i wanted to just sort of I'm going to ask a dumb question just because I kind of want to, I don't know, kind of tie some of your ability uh, to to this. And you could tell me no on any of these. Uh, all right. Uh, historical figures. Just how you think they may smell. Uh, uh, dusty. <laughs> Damn. Wait, just ice cold. <laughs> Wait. Oh no, no, no. Oh, you mean general, <laughs> you know what? Never mind. This is already, this is already, this is already stillborn. <laughs> Smell, You'll have uh, to be more specific, I think. Smell, uh, fucking dead, I think. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, I, I will name a historical figure. Please tell me, uh, I guess, briefly how you think they smell. Okay. All right. Saddam Hussein. <laughs> wow. Strong beginning. Uh, like dirt and tobacco. Okay. Ooh. Uh, I would say, uh, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Um, uh, wine, incense, myrtle leaf, um, linen, <laughs> um, mm, yeah. Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> caviar. That's a good one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Sigmund Freud. Ooh. Like cigars and dog. Mm-hmm. Yes. And just for the other flip of that coin, it'll be the last one. Carl Jung. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like Nong Champa incense and uh, um, probably also a little bit of cigar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are nice with it. Wet wool. Yes. <laughs> Oh, hell yeah. Well, Marissa, <laughs> Marissa, uh, we really, we really appreciate uh, you appearing and uh, speaking with us. I think I speak for uh, uh, all of us when I think this has been a conversation I don't think we've really had uh, on this uh, sort of subject before. And it, it, it feels kind of great to sort of exchange it and, and. Well, yeah, it's. It's good ground for us to cover because what you went over was, you know, a lot of stuff that that I think people that hopefully listen to our podcast who create 
or work in, in their own independent ways in whatever medium, they can learn a little bit about what's different in your field and also about the, the commonalities. Like we discussed, you know, access across all these fields being kind of um, difficult and complicated. And and uh, it's just cool to, to be able to kind of, I would say you're our most um, out of left field guest in that I couldn't think of another perfumer would be able to talk to. And it's it's been awesome to have you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've never actually listened to a podcast where people talked about smells. And yeah, I, that is that is what I wanted. I want a discussion of of senses. Yeah, I haven't really either, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where where can where can people find uh, you and your work? Yes, um, they can find me um, <clears throat> on social media, just at my first and last name, Marissa Zappis. Um, and they can shop my perfumes at uh, redamance.com, R-E-D-A-M-A-N-C-E. Mm. Uh, do you have any sort of really, really new perfume right now that you're like, hey, you got to get it. It's hot. It is on the streets now. <laughs> yeah my cake perfume and also i'm about to launch the spring summer sample bags in one week so really excited Excellent. about that those those should be out by the time this airs then um, oh, we'll be sure we'll be sure to yeah we'll be sure to link those in our uh, little show description i'm awesome. gonna buy that i i bought the i bought the winter this is an endorsement i bought the winter set and i love it i've been wearing it probably every day <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you for being good at what you do. I, I, I really appreciate your work and the think the the thought that you put into it is really something else. I don't think I've ever seen another per perfumer write about what they do in that way. Thank you. It means a lot. I really feel like I'm trying to do something different. So, um, yeah. yeah. You know, in a, in, a, in a space where, yeah, it hasn't been done. So that really means a lot to me. Well, on that note, we again thank Marissa. I'm Michelle Perez, as always. Jake uh, Rubin, uh, Eliza Gager, the Buddies Three. Uh, this has been working on it.